All right, welcome back after our lunch and breaks. Um, our next session is going to be featuring Keith Robinson and Luke Higgins. Um, as has been done before, I'll give you a brief bio on each of them at the beginning, and then Keith will give his presentation first, and then Luke, and then we'll open it up uh, for questions and responses. <clears throat> so Keith Robinson's teaching and research have been concerned primarily with three main areas, first being the European traditions of thought that emerged from Kant and post-Kantian philosophy, especially 19th and 20th century continental thinkers. Secondly, a strong interest in modern process philosophy. And finally, in the interconnections between these two areas. He's uh, on faculty at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock. <coughs> and Luke Higgins, let me go back, come back to my page here. His interests lie at the intersection of constructive theology, process thought, continental philosophy, science studies, and ecological philosophy. That's all. <laughs> 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 He received his doctorate, doctorate from Drew University in Theological and Philosophical Studies, where he studied with constructive theologian Catherine Keller. Um, I think that probably, and you're now with South University in Savannah, Georgia, a place dear to my heart. So let's uh, begin. S Savannah, not South University. <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 Savannah is dear to my heart. <laughs> okay, well, please begin. All right, well, thank you. Um, so my paper is... Uh, pretty long, so I've tried to find a way of um, boiling it down and reducing it for our 30-minute session. Uh, and so you're going to get the sort of highlights. Uh, um, okay, so perhaps the, the, the problem that drives uh, White's philosophy of nature and his metaphysics is the relation between internal and external standpoints, the relation between the subjective viewpoint here and the objective view from nowhere in particular, what Whitehead famously called the bifurcation of nature. All of Whitehead's metaphysical concepts are constructed with this problem in mind, and his theories of symbolism and perception are no exception. In fact, by tracing out Whitehead's understanding of perception and symbolism, we follow one route through the problem of bifurcation. As is well known, Whitehead responds to bifurcation in his later works with his one genus theory of bipolar or dipolar actual occasions designed to circumvent or escape the difficulties associated with the various dualisms and materialisms of the tradition. Whitehead's theory ascribes a physical pole to every occasion as well as a more or less recessive uh, mental pole. Thus experience or perception and Whitehead generalizes and quotes them is a contrast, an integration and a synthesis of physical inheritance and more or less conceptual reaction. Conceptual appetition here should not be identified with consciousness. For Whitehead, consciousness is contingent and derivative, an evolutionary later form of integration. Physical inheritance and conceptual appetition correspond to the two modes, the two pure modes of perception, which are fused uh, symbolically in experience. Whitehead's accounts of perception are amongst his most important philosophical legacies because they challenge the bifurcation of nature and they attempt to show the connectedness of occasions. Whitehead ties his account of perception to what I'm going to call a generalized or originary account of symbolism. The logic of Whitehead's original or arche symbolism is grounded in the claim that no symbolizing unit can be absolutely present and immediate that is always divided by a time that preserves or conforms to the past and opens on to an indeterminate future. There is no simple occurrence and no simple location, only the bare or minimal sense in which a symbol references another time or place. Originary symbolism is the power to affect or be affected, an exposure to what happens in <coughs> condition, not just for language or experience, for all becoming a life. This critique of natural perception and the generalization of an originary differential structure is also taken up and developed in great detail and complexity in the work of the French philosopher Gilles Deleuze. For Deleuze, life is an immense flowing movement of vague and obscure images, singularities and intensities in the midst of things, the prehension of one by the other or the passage and communication from one to the other, such that consciousness is already a becoming 
immersed in things rather than a being independent. Contrasting Whitehead's account of originally sim originary symbolism with Deleuze will enable us to draw out some of the radical innovations and variations of the process view with regard to perception, time, and becoming, and the implications these have for thinking about uh, bifurcation. So Whitehead then. <clears throat> so presentational immediacy and causal efficacy are pure modes of perception, but experience synthesizes and combines them in the complex mode of symbolic reference. They both, in their differing modes, objectify things in the environment directly, but their complete purity is unobtainable. Independently, they are abstractions. As Whitehead says, quote, perception in the mode of causal efficacy discloses that the data in the mode of sense perception are provided by it. Thus, in practice, the two modes of perception are fused and interrelated through what Whitehead calls a common ground, enabling symbolic reference to take place. Stripped back to its essentials, the common ground of symbolism for Whitehead is a movement of time where one component of experience is directed towards, relates to, or refers to another component or element in experience. The term that Whitehead uses in symbolism is confirmation, and sometimes he talks about this as the vector character involved in experience. In other words, the causal influences within the symbolizing process conform to the past and have a direction which is marked or felt more or less directly by the other element. As Whitehead puts it, this time in relation to feelings, he says, quote, feelings are vectors but they feel what is there and they transform it into what is here. So at the base of experience, we find a symbolizing process <clears throat> excuse me, which requires that a component temporally reference be directed toward or feel another component um, for, it to, for itself, for itself um, or for it to convey meaning. For Whitehead, the symbolizing process is a reciprocal relation where Either term in the relation can play one of the roles, but the temporal directionality remains. In relation to language, Whitehead gives the example of the word tree, and the tree itself asks why the word tree is a symbol for trees. The tree itself could just as well function as a symbol for the world. Abstracting from human experience, symbolism does not require consciousness, subjectivity, or agency as such only that one entity both respond to or be present in another, although the relation and the components will vary greatly. So each component enters into the experience as equals, is what it says, um, with no one component taking precedence over the other. Nothing is simply present or absent, since each element presupposes temporal syntheses or referrals, which prevent any one element simply referring to itself. So this notion that an individual element is temporally located in and present in all of the others for it to symbolize, I suggest is the originary symbolism at the heart of Whitehead's metaphysics. No symbol is ever fully present to itself, but refers to the spacing by means of which the symbolizing elements are related to each other. No symbol can be meaningful in of itself, that must be inscribed within a chain of referrals that bears the marks of all these others within itself. All that originary symbolism in Whitehead's sense requires is that there's something to be received, a transmission, a passage or a transference of the receptor, and an act of reception or inheritance. However, although the radical implications of this chain of references and referrals provides the rationale or the apocal structure of temporal occasions that comes from the four in process and reality. It will also, I suggest, threaten to undermine and displace this rationale when viewed through a Deleuzean lens. So this is what I want to compare and contrast. Um, Whitehead's notions here of, of an apocal unit with um, a Deleuzean idea of, if you like, originary symbolism, which um, I think operates on the idea that these references and referrals, that all of these sort of temporal syntheses, you know, go on for infinity. I mean, there's an infinite regress in, in all directions. And the paradox is that that infinite regress 
um, produces. Deleuze explores in various books, for example, uh, The Logic of Sense. Um, but it seems to me that, that Deleuze embraces this, um, all of the paradoxes that come along with um, the idea that originary symbolism um, presupposes a, an, infinite, an infinite regress of temporal referrals and sy synthesis. So the structure of originary symbolism can be traced to the condition of time, since the general function of symbolism is to mediate between past and future. For one element to symbolize another, it must conform to the immediate past and anticipate the immediate future. Symbolizing necessarily occupies a duration in which the present is immediately divided by conforming with a past that's preserved in the present and a future that is anticipated, invoked, or elicited. So with this structure, I think Whitehead is very close to William James. And William James's famous descriptions of what he calls a specious present, albeit generalized beyond the stream of consciousness, to indicate that experience never captures the individual present moments of a now, um, but only a present that stretches back into the past and forward into the future. Um, <clears throat> In parentheses here, I've got a sort of remark about phenomenology. Um, maybe we'll be able to talk about that in discussion. I, 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 I um, note the comments that you made and your, your polemic um, <laughs> <laughs> against phenomenology. Um, you know, I think there are all kinds of interesting connections between Whitehead and a whole bunch of different phenomenologists, including my local team. Uh, but maybe we'll have a chance to, to talk about that. So whether whether Whitehead's own, um, you know, epochal structure of time is close to, for example, a sort of protentive or re retentive structure, uh, that you, the kind of thing that you get in Husserl, I think is is really interesting and worth and worth pursuing. Again, I think it's you know it's lifted out of the whole notion of, of you know a transcendental consciousness or a transcendental subject you know, that you were talking about. Now. Um, so the present is specious in that it's never immediately available in an instantaneous now moment or a knife edge or atomic sensation as such, but only in a block or an epoch that stretches through a continuity of immediate past and future moments. However, like James, the durational act itself for Whitehead is not a continuity. Only the moments in the dur duration are felt continuously. Whitehead not only adopts the phrase specious present, and the idea that the individual units of experience come in epochs. Um, but he also accepts James, James's view that although the percipient event is temporally extended, the act of perceiving is itself a unity that's unextended and indivisible. In other words, the content of the units of experience or objects of symbolic reference undergo temporal extension, but the form remains unextended. As we've seen, for Whitehead, symbolic reference combines a spatializing moment which retains the immediate past and anticipates the immediate future. But as a formal whole, the experience is given as a unifying epoch or an, indivis an indivisible living presence um, that doesn't have temporal extension. So this, it seems to me, is Whitehead's and James's response to Zeno. Um, as Whitehead puts it, quote, if we admit that something becomes, it's easy by employing Zeno's method to prove that there can be no continuity of becoming. There is becoming of continuity, but no continuity of becoming. So symbolizing units or actual occasions become and they constitute together an extensive world um, in which only extensiveness becomes. Quote, but becoming is not extensive. Becoming occurs within the symbolizing process, but the act of symbolism occurs all at once, so that reality grows for Whitehead just as it does for James, by buds or drops of perception. So you can divide the experience analytically upon reflection, but as it's immediately given, it's all or nothing, or as Whitehead says, all, all at once. Thus, Whitehead writes, quote, the conclusion is that in every act of becoming, there is the becoming of something with temporal extension, but the act itself is not extensive in the sense that it's divisible into earlier and later acts of becoming, 
which correspond to the extensive divisibility of what has become. End quote. So Whitehead distinguishes the, the form, if you like, of becoming, the structure of the act of experience or symbolizing from the content in which something becomes in order to shore up the infinite regress that Zeno's paradox threatens. The apocal structure of occasions is supposed to put an end to temporal regression by being constitutive of itself and providing a unity and synthesis to the becoming that mediates reference. So the act of becoming as a non-temporal unity thereby ensures that the chain of symbolic reference doesn't continue without origin or end. This structure of time underlying the process of symbolizing can be usefully contrasted with Deleuze, since in his accounts, as we'll see, the very movement of temporal regress is to be equated with a structure of, of temporalization that disrupts directionality, disrupts seriality, reverses before and after, and generally overflows the stream of experience. In such conditions, we can find an originary symbolism expressed as an open structure of differences, or what Deleuze calls a becoming unlimited, that precedes and makes possible the phenomena of perception identified by White. So a little bit about Deleuze then. Um, Deleuze's accounts of perception are scattered throughout his works, and they're rich and complex and multi-layered. In several of these texts, Deleuze has not hidden his affinity with Whitehead's thought, indeed with Whitehead's understanding of perception, at points explicitly embracing Whitehead's concept of prehension. However, Deleuze and Deleuze and Guattari's own concepts of perception provide an interesting contrast to Whitehead, since they show both striking resemblances and a variation of the process view on originary symbolism. We said that um, perception, we said that Whitehead's thought is driven by the problem of dualism and the bifurcation of nature. Deleuze is also deeply concerned with this problem. Deleuze's own term for bifurcation, I think, is transcendence. Transcendence is the appeal to any idea or principle that doesn't explain the genesis of a phenomenon by its imminent features, but appeals to something external to its genesis, something immutable, something made, <laughs> something unchanging or in itself to explain the things coming to be. For Deleuze, the achievement of philosophy would be to break with transcendence to arrive at what he calls pure immanence, an immanence of being and thought that cannot be reduced to objective matter or subjective mind. The achievement of imminence here would be to account for the relation between bifurcated terms, not through a transcendent third term or identity, but in terms of a difference internal to and constitutive of the distinction. So pure imminence is imminent only to itself, a difference that differs internally with itself. As soon as imminence is imminent to something other than itself, then difference has become externalized or transcendent or bifurcated. Um, in terms of Deleuzean imminence, to try to understand perception in the context of the traditional uh, epistemological relation between perceiver and perceived is to set out with a badly posed problem. Since one starts out from a plane of transcendence where difference is already externalized. Rather for Deleuze, perception itself is a difference, a more fundamental internal difference that's constitutive of any distinction between perceiver and perceived. Um, <clears throat> Deleuze also distinguishes at least two modes of perception uh, in his work and emphasizes what we can call um, differential efficacy, the efficient power of difference to affect and constitute experience. Indeed, in his remarkable book on Leibniz, the, the fold, Leibniz and the Baroque, Deleuze uses Whitehead's distinction between microscopic process and macroscopic process to understand how differential perceptions are created as, far as what he calls folds in the virtual, like so many little creases and pleats that require a process of differentiation or creation to be unfolded. Micro perceptions are little folds that unravel in every direction. They are minute, vague, obscure, or confused perceptions, or what Whitehead calls perception 
in the mode of causal efficacy. They make up our macro perceptions, which are conscious, clear, and distinct perceptions, or perceptions in the, in the form of Whiteheadian presentational immediacy. For conscious perception or high grade forms of symbolism, symbolic reference in Whitehead, to happen, macro perceptions must be continually destabilized by a series of infinite micro perceptions um, that prepare a new perception. Micro perceptions are both constituent elements of perception as well as, as, well as tiny agents of change and passage that nourish the new perception. The microscopic distinction uh, distinguishes perceptions and appetitions one from the other so that we arrive at composite folds and forms immediately present. The microscopic, however, issues from a power of causality that can be seen from two perspectives. So on the one hand, the microscopic conveys an infinite world that it contains, but equally, every conscious perception implies an infinity of tiny perceptions that prepare, compose, or follow from it. The relations between the microscopic and the macroscopic are not to be conceived as a part to a whole, but as a relation between what is ordinary and what is remarkable. Out of the obscure and dark background, unconscious um, of inconspicuous tiny perceptions, quote, the obscure dust of the world, as, as Deleuze puts it, some perceptions are formed and, and drawn into clarity. And I've got a quote here from, from Deleuze's book. For example, he says, the colour green. Yellow and blue can, be, can surely be perceived, but if their perception vanishes by dint of progressive diminution, they enter into differential relations that determines green, and nothing impedes yellow or blue, each on its own account, from being already determined by the differential relation of two colours that we cannot detect, end quote. So out of the dark and effervescent perceptions, yellow and blue, a clear perception of green is established. And yellow and blue can also be clear perceptions if they're drawn into clarity by um, differential relations, among other minute and obscure perceptions. Such is the case with, um, and Deleuze gives you all these sort of examples that you get in Leibniz. Uh, so such is the case with examples of, of hunger, the sound of the famous sound of the sea in, in Leibniz, and the sleeper, um, for whom all of the little creases and folds enter into relations that produce an attitude that, and, and a position that induces sleep. Deleuze's favourite example here, of course, is taken from the great ethologist um, von Uxkuhl, uh, and it's the example of, of the tick. Um, and the tick has essentially three clear perceptions, a perception of light, an olfactory perception of its prey, and a tactile perception of the best place to burrow. All the rest is numbness, Deleuze says, a dust of du tiny, dark, and scattered perceptions that make up the vast uh, backdrop of nature. So it seems to me there are, there are similarities in um, the way in which Deleuze talks about perception. Um, throughout his text, but I, I pick the, the distinctions out that he draws upon in, in the Leibniz book. It seems to me they're very, it's very close to Wiley, but it seems to me that, you know, Deleuze is going much deeper, much further back, I think. I mean, he's talking about, it seems to me, the conditions for the kinds of perceptual phenomena that um, Whitehead's talking about. Um, so I've got a final section. How much time do I have left? Seven and a half minutes. Seven and a half minutes. Well, that's good. Because I've only got... You can slow down. I can slow down. <laughs> and I can maybe read the bits that I've crossed out. We'll see. Okay, so final section then. So uh, both Deleuze and Whitehead developed their views of perception in relation to the broader problem that their work seeks to engage. For both the problem of dualism, understood as the bifurcation of nature or transcendence, is one of the motivating problems of their work. And both find in the empiricist and rationalist traditions resources for their own ontological accounts of perception. For both Deleuze and Whitehead, perception puts us directly in contact with the real. Indeed, perception is the real. Whitehead and Deleuze share a commitment to what I've called an originary symbolism, or a, a primary process of perception, in which experience directly con conditions, prehends, 
or communicates with the thing itself. This more fundamental form of perception is a dynamic and constitutive um, relation between prehensions, the temporal and affective relation of occasions, differences, becomings, or images where one flow or series <coughs> intersects with another, affects it, or is affected by it. To reach this idea of a primary process or pure perception, Whitehead generalizes from a human subjective point of view. It reaches beyond any individual consciousness. As we've seen, however, in Whitehead's metaphysical works, um, the subject-object structure of this process is increasingly atomized. And I think more and more in process and reality this becomes the case. Um, at the expense of the continuity of becoming. So that's when you start getting all these descriptions in, in process and reality, for example, of dead data, of um, you know, a kind of discontinuous structure of, of a popular occasion. Deleuze, in contrast, appeals to the continuity of a, a non-human pure perception, an originary nowhere, or a virtual plenitude, and sees an atomized or individual point of view, however extended, as a limitation of the virtual field of differences, the canalization of the becomings, thank you, that traverse the non-organic flow, and the accounts of symbolism and perception in Whitehead and Deleuze. Um, by their understanding. Deleuze, in contrast, appeals to the continuity of non-human perception, however extended as a limitation of the virtual field uh, of differences, a canalization of becomings and traverse the non-organic flow of life. Um, okay, so these accounts of, of symbolism and perception in Whitehead and Deleuze are conditioned by their understanding of, of time and becoming. Whitehead insists in several texts, especially process and reality, that time is atomized and epochal. Like James, for, for Whitehead, reality grows in drops and buds, and so time can be thought of uh, as, a, as a continuity. Uh, so time cannot be thought of as a continuity. As Whitehead says, quote, temporalization is not another continuous process. It's an atomic succession, uh, thus time is atomic or epochal, uh, though what is temporalized is divisible, end quote. So Whitehead arrives at this position as a result of an analysis of Zeno. If we analyze the act of becoming with the premises that something becomes and every act of becoming is divisible into earlier acts of becoming, then we end up in the contradiction of an infinite regress where nothing becomes. So to use Whitehead's example, if we take an act of becoming during one second, we can divide that act into two, namely the act of becoming in the first half of the second, and the act of becoming in the second half of the second, and operating with the above premises, quote, that which becomes during the whole second presupposes that which becomes during the first half second. Analogously, that which becomes during the first half second presupposes that which becomes during the first quarter second, and so on uh, indefinitely. So if we consider the process of becoming up to the beginning of the second in question, and ask what, what becomes, Whitehead concludes no answer can be given. <laughs> the infinite regress leads to a contradiction in the notion of becoming, because if the act of becoming is itself temporally divisible, it cannot act as a synthetic unity for something to become. <clears throat> Fundamentally, no symbolizing or perceptual process can be self-constituting if it's subject to the temporalization of pure becoming. Indeed, quote, uh, this is a quote from Process and Reality, these conclusions are required by the consideration of Zeno's arguments. So I've just got a final page, and then I, I, should be, I should be done. For Whitehead, the claim that the regress of becoming would make it impossible to think originary symbolism appears as a presupposition of the true thought. What is distinctive of Deleuze's process philosophy is the idea that originary symbolism, or the originary logic, the notion of sense, not only doesn't need a primal ground or non-temporal unity to perform the requisite synthesis, but is constituted by a pure or absolute becoming that functions as a condition for the movement of temporalization. So infinite regress or becoming unlimited is the originary movement of time in the world, a movement that ungrounds any origin or end. For Deleuze, out of the paradoxes of pure becoming emerges a conception of time which is consistent with indefinite divisibility and infinite regress. 
But Deleuze, we can think originary symbolism as the synthesis of time um, without positing a non-temporal act or an atomic unity. Indeed, all that's required to exemplify originary or archie symbolism in Deleuze's sense is the structure of symbolic reference, um, but released from epochal unity and subject to absolute differentiation of becoming. So the now of immediacy is divided between its own becoming, uh, its own becoming past, which is simultaneously pointing toward a future. Immediacy is a primal symbolism or reference that enables repetition across time and perception to take place. Like Whitehead, Deleuze's original symbolism is conditioned by time, but it's a time that ungrounds all temporal unities in a generalized opening of uh, difference and becoming, of experience and difference and becoming. And in the longer paper, I, I won't inflict you on this now, I won't inflict this on you now, but in the longer paper, I talk about the three syntheses of time in, in Deleuze's difference and repetition. Um, so Deleuze lays out there the three synthesis of time and gives an account of how they perform this work. What I want to suggest is that the conception of time that we get in Whitehead um, and that underpins Whitehead's own notion of, of originary symbolism is consistent with Deleuze's description of time given in the first synthesis. But he doesn't include anything like the second and third synthesis, certainly not the third synthesis since these syntheses cannot be recognised within the serial and successive movements of Whitehead's epochal structure of time. Deleuze offers an account of time and becoming that's prior to and makes possible the modes of perception and symbolism that, that Whitehead describes. And there's, a, there's another account, there's, there's the three syntheses of time that Deleuze talks about in difference and repetition, but there's another account that we might be able to talk about, which is perhaps a little bit easier, that Deleuze gives in, in the logic of sense and Deleuze and Guattari talk about in A Thousand Plateaus, which is really what he calls two readings of time. And that's probably an easy... I probably should have talked about that in my paper rather than, <laughs> rather than the three synthesis, because he doesn't, he, he doesn't really come back to that. With Guattari, he doesn't really come back to the three syntheses. He talks about the two readings that come up in, in the logic of sense. And the two readings are, you know, Kronos and Iron. And he comes back to that distinction. He rarely comes back to the three synthesis. It's really only in um, different repetition. So that's it. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Lou, you're up next. up next. All right. So my paper is entitled uh, From Manipulation to Co Creation. Whitehead on the Ethics of Symbol Making. Um, so, you know, in this paper, I'm really, because I'm kind of valorizing symbol making and symbol revision over, uh, you know, uh, I, I take that as permission for me to kind of revise my own paper and kind of go off the rails a little bit in what I'm going to uh, talk about. Um, just, uh, just to kind of, I think, and I think actually um, this will help kind of frame the approach I took in this paper. Um, so that's what I'm going to start with, and then I'm going to kind of move into more of a, a summary of, of, of the paper itself. Um, so I think, in a way, I'm picking up on, I have a similar concern to Adam. I guess Adam just stepped out. But um, in, in the sense that I, you know, the, the point of this, of holding up symbol making and symbol revision is to challenge a kind of symbolism in, that's in a groove, right? That's kind of, um, where the symbol and the meaning are just automatic, right? And assumed to be just part of the structure of reality, right? And then, um, so it empowers this kind of thoughtlessness and, and kind of thinking in a groove that, you know, Stengers takes issue with. Um, so really to, to, you know, I think I'm after something similar, to, to slow down the symbol meaning link, right? Um, uh, to, uh, to help us, encourage us to ask that question again and again, a kind of slower uh, process of symbol making. Um, so, uh, so of course, you know, when I talk about symbol making, right, not just symbol making, but symbol revision, et cetera, you get that. It's not, not, we don't necessarily need new symbols all the time, right? We want to figure out, uh, reconfigure the ones that we have. And that's, that's really important, right, for the stability of life on this planet, which, which is something that Whitehead is important to Whitehead. Okay, so this recognition, 
um, would be in contrast to uh, this, the assumption that symbolic constructs kind of exist ready-made, right? That they're just there already, either as immutable laws that inhere in the structure of the natural world, um, or as you know transcendent teleological ordering principles from this kind of divinity. And so I work with theology, so interestingly, I see a symbol, a similar kind of logic of kind of a stuck symbolism, right? Uh, uh, or, or a kind of um, symbolism in a groove it, operating in theology and in, in sort of modern techno science. Um, so, uh, and this is the call in the paper to get Bill on, you know, being either manipulators of symbols, like in the natural world, or being kind of, uh, kind of um, allowing ourselves to be manipulated by transcendent symbols, whether those are, you know, religious or, you know, some, the symbols of the market that are manipulating us. Um, so, I mean, especially I think what Whitehead is doing in this book is, you know, really reminding us that symbolism is this basic building block for so many more aspects of our reality than we realize, right? This isn't just about European cathedrals, right? This is about language, algebra, religion, politics, and perception, right? Okay. Um, and this is, you know, what I love about Whitehead's philosophical strategy, which is he, he, he talks about all these different forms of knowledge seeking and kind of fits them within this kind of metaphysical rubric that kind of makes sense of them all together, which is part of his overcoming bifurcation, the bifurcation of knowledge. Um, so what I, what I kind of came to realize um, is that, you know, the significance of this recognition of this kind of symbolic constitution of reality, uh, you know, moves in two different directions, almost like opposite directions, depending on which side of the bifurcation of knowledge you're, you're applying it to, right? I mean, when it comes to, uh, you know, either kind of a common sense notion of perception, you know, I just see something that's there, just there, right? Um, or a scientific grasp of like just the facts of nature. Okay, the, the insight of this book is that, you know, we have a much more active role in constituting these things than we normally realize, right? These are, the symbolism, symbolic reference is synthetic, it's creative. It could have happened differently, right? So um, there's this uh, recognition to take responsibility for how these things do. We're not just reading it off of right, the world. So that's the kind of impact that it has on that, those kinds of symbols, right? But when, when, the, when the insights of this book get applied to this other realm of, of knowledge, like you know, values, morals, religious insights, aesthetics, okay, um, what the, the significance, the impact of, of the book is, is, is that you know, these things, these values are much more integral to the structure of reality than we normally imagine, right? If they're not just uh, a projection of the subjectivity, uh, you know, of our subjectivity to kind of aesthetically adorn a reality that's otherwise just ruled by, you know, you know flying particles, right? <laughs> Obeying these, these certain laws. Okay, so it really operates as, as, a, as a different kind of challenge depending on what uh, what you're applying it to, and and that kind of came to me as a as a later insight. So I kind of wanted to put that out there. Um, in any case, I think you know the the overall vision is one where you know reality is actively, creatively, and ecologically, which is to say, collectively constituted. Okay, so so. Um, and there's this open-endedness, right, in that process, and I, that that open-endedness. And how uh, and how we meet our world and how our world meets us is, is kind of well, I think really what a lot of what I'm focusing on and, and working with in this paper, because um, that's what we're working with with symbol making is this kind of magic, this open-ended magic, um, and I'll talk more about the magic. But um, so I think in some ways for me, um, like even though this it starts out as a as you know a, a, an epistemological and you know metaphysical reflection, I think ultimately it it the question shift to a more, a more fundamentally ethical set of questions, right? So, like, how is it that we make symbols, right? I mean, if yeah, uh, if that's what reality is, uh, and I and I use ethical, you know, in more of this kind of Spinoza's Deleuzian sense of like, you know, what what powers are we capable of, or what are we capable of being affected by, what are we capable of becoming? So that the ethics in this, you know, not not ethics as submit, you know, what laws do we submit to, but you know, so this more broad-minded. Sense. So that's kind of, I think, the shift in focus that this this allows us. So, um, um, so what you know, what what does this recognition then enable? Um, I think, I think, one of the most important parts is that it empowers us to be far more flexible with our modes of symbol making. Uh, flexible, experimental, right? Kind of a speculative experimentation, and and pragmatic. Um, 
So, uh, you know, and I think this links to a kind of Jamesian pragmatism where, you know, we, ask, we start asking the question more seriously, you know, or really more fundamentally, uh, what work do particular symbols do? What do they enable for us? And we have to see, in some ways, we can't know in advance what our symbols are going to, what work our symbols are going to do for us. Um, so, uh, you know, and I, I think of um, the work of Isabel Stenger's um, and she, she, in her, some of her readings of Whitehead, um, she talks about this uh, impetus to, uh, you know, this uh, calling us to care for our abstractions, to care for our abstractions. And I think this really works well with symbols. You know, what would it mean to care for our symbols, care for our symbol-making process? And for her, that means first, first and foremost, you know, not to bow down to what they're doing to us, right? Um, so that's gonna be hard to tell the religious people they can't bow down to their symbols. <laughs> but maybe it's important, right? Okay, okay anyways, but just bracketed thought. Um, it, not to push our symbols, caring for our symbols would be not to push our symbols to the point where they're just explaining away things, right? As opposed to enabling this kind of er, er, uh, uh, enriching our forms of life, right? Um, so the criteria for, you know, for if symbols are well, well cared for um, is, is really primarily a pragmatic criteria, right? There's no way to know, uh, to guarantee that these are good abstractions, right? You can't just read them off of the world and we can't just, you know, there's no uh, automatic process which you can purely invent them, right? So there's some, there's some uh, it's something else, right? Um, so uh, just, and I just wanna kind of drive that po point home um, in this quote from Whitehead. Symbolic reference leads to a transference of emotion, purpose, and belief, which cannot be justified by an intellectual comparison of the direct information from the two schemas and their elements of intersection. Right? There's no correct, ultimately right way to do, to, to, to you know, fuse these things. The justification, such as it is, must be sought in a pragmatic appeal to the future. A pragmatic appeal to the future. So, you know, think about how, you know, telling a scientist that they're the concepts, right, that really have to be judged based on a pragmatic appeal to the future, right? This is something like I think what, you know, Adam is pointing us to. Like, you know, let's, it, there's a lot of uh, pragmatic effects, right, of, our, of the way we use these concepts. And let's think more deeply and, you know, uh, you know in a more idiotic way, <laughs> right, about, about them. Okay. Um, so, um, and I also, you know, this also linked me to, um, so in, in this book, in the White Symbolism book, Whitehead says, you know, uh, symbol, uh, ex, uh, what is it, symbolism, or expression is symbolism. Expression is symbolism, and, and Sherry brought that out. Um, and actually, it's your paper that reminded me of that, that great quote in Modes of Thought, where Whitehead talks about the, uh, the sacrament of expression, right? And it seems to me like there's something sacramental, too, about this expression. So, um, now, of course, right, Isabel Stengers is reading this. She has no interest in this, the religious component. She's applying it to these much more kind of practical matters, right? Um, but what she focuses on in this, in this idea of the sacrament of expression um, is the ambiguity in how sacraments are efficacious. Uh, so, so on one hand, as Whitehead says, they're, they're, more, they're more than interpretable. They're more than interpretable. They are creative. Okay, so in, in this sense, you're right, the, the sacrament must be invoked, must be actively invoked. Yes, someone has to perform the sacrament, right? So the, it's, it's really Eucharist that is, that's the example informing this. Um, uh, but it can't elicit, this is Whitehead, it can't elicit what isn't there. So in other words, it has to, it has to have a foothold in reality. It has to have a foothold in some bigger structure, larger structures. So there's this, um, you know, there's this alignment, this kind of right, this kind of magical alignment where it's more like a, a like an artistic intuition kind of thing, right? Like what kinds of symbols? So it's it's this active, inventive kind of thing, right? It's novelty. It's a novelty um, of this this new symbol maker, right? On the other hand, it can't really do anything if it's not tapped into these bigger structures. And that ambiguity of, of, you know, um, of connecting those two poles you know, is, I think, so much of, of what enables symbols to, to do real life-giving work for us. It's this kind of, you know, um, almost, you know, this kind of ma chemist, this magical, you know, al this alchemy or something, I don't know. Um, so what would it, so I guess this, I'm just, Thinking about, you know, I talk about symbol making, but maybe symbol crafting is an even better, you know, phrase. Uh, you know, 
What would it mean to approach the work of philosophy, religion, and you know, theology in particular? It's really pressing there. Um, in terms of, of symbol crafting, so what would kind of well-crafted symbols do? Well, they would, I think they would impart, at least especially in the work that I do, which is kind of, you know, uh, ego theology of sorts, you know, among other things, uh, philosophically informed, you know. Um, so uh, that it, the right uh, well-crafted symbol would empower a fresh sensitivity, right, to our, to our present and to our future. So Whitehead talks about the way symbolism enables a, mi a miracle of sensitivity to a distant future. And this is the amazing thing about symbolic reference, right? However, uh, right, so, but it's not just, it's not just temporal here. Um, it's kind of, you know, spatial and, and kind of effective emotional. And, you know, in the work, you know, if we're talking about, you know, symbols that can uh, enable and empower, you know, environmental change or something, you know, it's like what they're really doing. It's like, how can they make things like the melting of the polar ice caps real and present and efficacious for us in this present moment, as opposed to just like the thinking in a group that just cuts ourselves off to just the things that we've been trained to look at and pay attention to, right? What would it mean to pay attention to, right, the effects of the GMOs, like down the road, like this temporal, this longer future? Future, right? That we're that we're kind of nested within. Um, so I, you know, so it, that seems to me that like the key problem here is like you know symbols that enable these sensitivities. Um, so um, and enable compassion, right? And you know this actually connects, I think, well with some of the, the recent work Latour has done on religion. He says, you know, religion is not. We, you have the stereotype that religion, you know, takes us into this far away realm of the transcendent of heaven. It's actually the opposite. That's actually what science does. Science constructs right networks that take us to that world really reliably, right? Um, religion actually, it, it does the opposite. Religion brings that far away world pre present, makes it present, makes it efficacious for us here. So, you know, these events, you know, these storms and, you know, disruptions in our ecology, like, or, you know, uh, you know horrible uh, racial abuses, racist abuses, you know, actually start to matter to us here. And, and religion, religious symbols are kind of what, are, are really the, a unique kind of symbolism that allows that. So, um, so I really didn't, none of that was really in my paper. <laughs> but, but it just seemed, I don't know, like it, it kind of, as you know, as we were reading everyone else's paper, you know, it, uh, I was triggered into, yeah, so yeah, symbol, symbol revision, right? Yeah, we're all <laughs> symbol revision. All right, so as we know, uh, it's all too easy to lapse back into, uh, you know, a mostly passive stance in relation to the symbolic meaning structures that constitute our reality, right? So we, we come out of that symbol-making mode, uh, whether it's in terms of, you know, just relying on these kind of immutable laws of nature or, you know, most pressingly, I think, you know, laws of economic, neoliberal economics, right? Oh, it's just let the market do its thing. Like, don't worry about it. Um, or, you know, certain kinds of uh, problematic, you know, religion where it's just like God has all the answers. You know, we just have to do what, do what the Bible says. Okay. Um, so, so how do we kind of, you know, so part of what this paper does is try to show how Whitehead accounts for this lapse. Okay. So, you know what, this is what I love about Whitehead. It's not just scolding us, saying bad people for lapsing into this. He's actually saying there's actually really good reasons why human beings do this. Okay. And it turns out to be kind of built into the structure of how symbolic reference works. Okay, uh, so um, yes, symbolic references have to be creatively forged, uh, but once this work has been done and they do some kind of pragmatic work for us, then the really utility for them comes in their repetition, right? And kind of automatic repetition. So we don't want to have to discover over and over again that this certain arrangement, spatial color plane arrangement uh, of, of our senses equals chair, right? We just want to, we kind of want to learn that once, right? Or, you know, when we're really young and, and now we just see the chair and sit down on it. And, you know, if I had to think about it every time, uh, you know, oh, is that a chair? Are we sure? Can we, you know, do I have to, you know, explore the meaning of these sense presentations, uh, then, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to do any, I wouldn't really have time for philosophy. I'd be, you know, just <laughs> trying to figure out how to drive my car every day, right? So, so this is important stuff, right? And, and um, Henri Bergson calls this habit memory, right? Habit memory. So just a short word about that, you know, this paper kind of started out as a comparison of White and Bergson. I ended up Excising Bergson mainly because he just had almost nothing interesting to say about symbols, but it's kind of, I think Bergson kind of haunts this paper, <laughs> um, and there's a kind of a way in which I'm reading Whitehead through a Bergsonian lens. Those of you who are familiar with him will kind of see this, and, and I'll bring him up a little bit as we go. But 
In any case, this sort of, and Whitehead, of course, calls this uh, reflex, right? This is this is congealing of certain symbol meaning linkages. So they just become automatic, right? The sim we see the symbol, we, you know, we have a given response. We see the stop sign, we just stop. We don't have to interpret that, okay? Um, so this is important, right? We wouldn't have, you know, be able to do really interesting things without it. Um, um, so, you know, and, and the, uh, so perception through this overlay of presentational immediacy over causal efficacy um, has evolved the capacity to automatically see those aspects of the world that have utility for us. This is a very Bergsonian insight, right? We, we see a world capable of yielding to a particular range of actions. That's kind of what, what, we, what we do. Um, and you know, I was just hanging out with my nephew, and this is that's really how he discovers this. He's a little two-year-old, two right? And he's he wants to touch things and see what he can do to things, right? That's how we kind of that's the I think how perception, the exploration of perception starts. Um, so, but this really yields, uh, you know, a world, the world that combines presentational immediacy and causal efficacy um, is one where we where we're, we're a subject in a world of objects, right? Um, so, and I think uh, part of what I do in this paper is is is, is kind of follow up on this hunch that some of the the, mis uh, the fallacy of misplaced concreteness, the particular version that we see in, in, in techno science, is actually kind of rooted in this kind of natural tendency in um, perception. How, what, what am I doing on time? I just want to know whether uh, I should go into this. Just under 12 minutes. Left? Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll kind of. I wanted to do some of the, the science stuff because uh, it resonates with what Adam's doing, but I'll, I'll kind of strike out. I'm kind of repeat what he does, and he, he might do it better than me anyway. So let's see. Um, um, right, so Berkson describes this evolutionary strategy as intelligence, right, as opposed to the instinct, which is more along the lines of, of a causal efficacy, where we're just receiving it, right? Intelligence, we make our world into a tool. We see our world as, uh, as a world of, of interest, as a world in which we can pragmatically act. Okay, um, so intelligence, uh, the, right, the being a human being with capable of symbolic reference, uh, it's a very creative and adaptive form of way, way of being in the world, right? But there, there are serious risks here. There's serious risks, a lot of risks. Uh, and Whitehead, of course, you know, highlights this. Okay, uh, you know, symbolism it, it performs these miracles of sensitivity. It enables all these things, but comes with some really serious risks. Um, you know, uh, Bergson focuses on two in particular. One is is nihilism, right? Because uh, we are can be aware of our own death, right? Um, and and just more in a more basic way, we just there's a sense of perishing, an awareness of perishing, okay, uh, of losing things that have that have value in particular moments. Um, the other danger is is uh, extreme egotism and the social fragmentation that comes that you know by being a, a subject in a world of objects, we kind of lose track of the fact that there are other objects, other other sub other subjects, you know, doing their thing too. Okay, so there, there are these risks. So I think Whitehead has, uh, you know, a really interesting reading of this uh, that's, that runs parallel to Bergson. Again, I'm not, I know I'm not doing Bergson, but um, so for Whitehead, you know, as beings for whom, pre um, you know, causal efficacy is really that mode of perception that, that ties us in with this bigger thing, right? We, we come out of this world and we contribute to this bigger world. So there's a sense of like, you know, we're, we're kind of a part of something. Um, uh, so, so as beings um, for whom presentational immediacy overlays this, uh, our connection with things is obscured, right? Because we see things more in terms of our potential to act on them. Um, so, uh, so I think, I think, and you see this. I think the, the furthest extreme of this intelligent, rational kind of tool-making uh, way of being in the world, it kind of ends up in this solipsism, right? And that's why I think in the Enlightenment, the great Enlightenment epistemologists, right, end up fixating on, on solipsism, being alone in the world. Because that kind of the, that's where, if you just focus on presentational immediacy, that's kind of where it takes you, um, in any case. Uh, but I think Whitehead has, has a bigger sort of diagnosis, a, a broader diagnosis of this, of this kind of existential despair that comes from being being symbol makers, okay? And it's not it's not just an illusion cast by presentational immediacy, right? Um, it's actually rooted in in some deeper structures, um, which um, he talks about in terms of evil, uh, in specifically in, in process and reality. So I'm going to kind of dive a little bit into the paper now. Um, 
and uh, talk about this, this, this structure of evil, which is, which is really the structure of mutual obstruction. Okay? Um, for Whitehead, the foundation of evil is built into his understanding of the atomic inventive. This is the bottom of page 11, sorry. For Whitehead, the foundation of evil is built into his understanding of the atomic inventive structure of reality. It lies in what he calls perpetual perishing. The basic problem is that the more intensity and vivid beauty a given threat of occasions can marshal, the less likely this threat will be able to sustain its unique life structure through time. In Whitehead's philosophy, this functions as the source of something like a basic existential anxiety. Quote, the world is thus faced by the paradox that, at least in its higher actualities, it craves for novelty and yet is haunted by terror at the loss of the past. End quote. This is to say that the greater the complexity and richness achieved, the greater the toll that the natural tendency toward mutual obstruction will take. The higher forms of life thus make a special wager with the metaphysical conditions of reality. They take the risk of assembling something more significant, but then must also accept the condition of heightened fragility. Within this context, destructive and or self-destructive tendencies have a much higher probability of emerging. Another way of putting it is that our uniquely human capacity to envision the possibilities of our individual futures leaves us haunted by the fear of perishing. It also leaves our species prone to a unique brand of, brand of egotism capable of a level of destruction unheard of before on this planet. The ability to degrade, possibly beyond repair, the ecological matrix which sustains all planetary life. So from here I, I go into sort of uh, a suggestion that it, that one of the responses to this kind of anxiety of our of, of our kind of existence uh, and our mode of perceiving and and our mode of being technological tool making beings in the world um, is uh, a resurgence of this kind of traditional um, religion you know kind of fundamentalist type religion and this is really kind of more of a Bergsonian insight than Lucian so I won't spend too much time with it but but what Bergson is says is that the excesses of intelligence lead to a reassertion of instinct in the form of what he calls closed religion and morality right which shores up the bonds of particular societal groups so there's something like that happening in in the last part of the, the symbolism book right because I mean there's a sense that you know there's this risk Symbolism brings this risk of too much novelty and too much fragmentation, right? Um, but then, like, symbolism also kind of shores up uh, the, the social bonds, right? Gives people an identity so they can feel, you know, that. And I think, so Whitehead is, you know, a lot more optimistic about this, this the way the instinct can work, uh, you know, to kind of, uh, kind of connect social bonds, um, but he, does, you know, but he does talk about it as prejudice, right? It's fundamentally kind of this prejudice, right? So it it, it can be problematic. Um, uh, so, um, so what's the way, really, you know? And obviously, uh, the problem is, is that you know. Uh, it, it ends up setting certain societal groups against other groups, and really the species against the planet. So it, it doesn't really solve our problem, and it doesn't embrace symbol making, right? Because the symbols are just attributed to this divine sphere, right? They're ready made in heaven, right? And we just have to obey them. So that's not that's not going to really work for my symbol making. Okay. So what's 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 the way forward? What you know? How can we sort of gather this kind of courage and inspiration to do this 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 hard work, right? Of of of, of a kind of symbol making that can allow for a planetary floor. Uh, you know, and sort of, you know, really what we're talking about now is just averting like just total chaos and destruction uh, with climate change. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna read sort of the, the last section of my paper, um, and this I start out with this quote a third of the way down, page 13. Um, this process of time veils the past below distinctive feeling. There is a unison of becoming among things of the present. So those two sentences, right, this process of time veils the past below distinct feeling. That's, that's the kind of vague insistence of causal efficacy. But there's a unison of becoming among things of the present. It's presentational immediacy. Why should there not be novelty without loss of this direct unison of immediacy among things? Uh, I take that to mean, like, why can't there be um, a kind of novelty that, that still is, stays connected in the world? Uh, in this last sentence, Whitehead both clearly states the problem and hints it away beyond it. 
Our immersion in causal efficacy is what offers an intuitive, pre-rational sense of emerging from a larger past and contributing to a larger future. In other words, of being integrally connected to an encompassing world. This interactive mode, however, contributes little to the uniquely human achievement of novel, vivid immediacy in our lives. This is only possible through the overlay of presentational immediacy. But the latter tends to instill within us a deeply insecure sense of transience and hollowness. We can experience our own intrinsically valuable novelty only at the expense of access to anyone or anything else's intrinsically valuable novelty. But what if there were a sphere of reality in which harmonic intensity did not sacrifice unison of immediacy and vice versa? This, of course, is Whitehead's signal toward a unique conception of divinity, one whose unconditional absorption in the, of the world, God has no negative prehensions, culminates in an everlasting divine vision that fuses limitless possibility with actual tragic beauty. Moreover, it is this divinity that conditions and releases each new event into its own unique iteration of becoming. In these reflections, perhaps we can hear Whitehead a call, uh, hear from Whitehead a call to draw from a deeper source for the courage and inspiration necessary to take up the challenge of a kind of symbol making and symbol revision conducive not just to the flourishing of our own life, but the life of the entire biocultural collective of which we are part. This source would empower a form of universal connection and belongingness that at the same time would release each of us into our own irreplaceable creativity and agency. Whitehead seems to be searching for a symbol or set of symbols to convey this very possibility in his reflections at the end of Adventures of Ideas. While the symbol of love comes close to capturing what, is he, what he is after, he ultimately finds it too narrow in scope. For love is most commonly expressed as love of the particular, whereas what he is after is something quite different, namely love of the universal. While Whitehead does not draw quite a severe distinction between these two as Henry Bergson does in his late work on ethics, especially two sources of morality and religion, like Bergson, he understands that this difference, that this is a difference in kind, not just degree. The difference between love and, and kind of love of all, right? Um, he finally arrives at the symbol of peace as more conducive to the broader meaning he is seeking as a way of gesturing towards a kind of limited answer to the question I posed at the beginning of this paper, I offer the following extended quote from Whitehead's Extent Adventures of Ideas. And really, the, uh, the question being, like, what kinds of symbols are capable of um, right, empowering this kind of this love, not just of, ac of acquisition and like saving my own skin, but uh, a kind of creative, inventive process that still meets the world, that still has a foothold, right, in this larger world that kind of is faithful to something bigger, um, but is still, you know, this kind of individual creative, you know, invention, right? So I, I'm not gonna go through this whole quote, but here's just the key elements. Um, this peace, so this is the you know peace as the symbol that maybe can start doing some of this work. You know, this. So um, its first effect is the removal of acquisitive feeling arising from the soul's preoccupation with itself. Thus, peace carries with it a surpassing of personality. So this drawing from this larger well that causal efficacy gives us access to. More accurately, it preserves the springs of energy and at the same time masters them for the avoidance of paralyzing distinctions. The experience of peace is largely beyond the control of purpose. It comes as a gift. So I just have one more paragraph. Um, I know I'm, I'm, I'm there. Uh, as, practically <laughs> lucid, as practically lucid as it is mystically charged, this invocation seeks a way beyond what are most commonly experienced to be life's mutually inhibiting features. The springs of connective creative energy can actually be focused in a new way rather than having their vividness blunted by an expansion of our awareness beyond our individuality. This passage points to an intuitive trust in the rhythmic unfolding of a life that takes us beyond the usual fear of loss. It does not change the fact that what we have in this moment will at some point have to be let go of. Perishing does not cease to be you know, a part of reality. But life's wondrous arc and its singularizing, spiraling motions will emerge again and again in countless times and places. And there is a deep, an omnipresent place from which we can know, or at least intuit, that we are never ultimately cut off from this spring of life's ongoing singularization. Perhaps one of the lessons here is that if our destiny as symbol makers on behalf of this planetary biocollective is truly to be embraced, if it is not to fall back into nihilistic melancholy or clinging egotism, it must in some sense be received as a gift from the universe. 
There's this strangely paradoxical logic here of having to receptively open ourselves to the very source for our most active, right, creative actions, a logic uh, in which perhaps artists and mystics feel most at home. And while this, certain, this certainly does not offer anything like a straightforward formula success, right, there is none for symbol crafting, um, it is my hope that it might help nourish us for the ecological and symbolical work of the world we have before us. So thanks. <laughs> So if we stick to our schedule, we have 15 minutes for questions. Do we want to stick a little longer? Oh, go a little longer? OK. So yeah, we started late. Half of the group that came late, the others came late. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, would either of you like to respond first to each other's papers, or would you like to just open it to the audience, the group? Well, I have, I have something to say to Keith. Um, yeah. I, uh, I, I, I really, really enjoyed your paper, and, and you're, you're working with this encounter between, you know, Deleuze, uh, Whitehead's kind of epical theory of actual occasions, right, and 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 Deleuze's, uh, you know, more, you know, really different, doing a lot of the same, but but really different, his his understanding of time. Um, I'm having to switch gears now and do another paper. <laughs> uh, switching symbols. Okay. Um, I guess my. Uh, my, it seems to me that you kind of arrive um, at, uh, you know, this hunch that maybe D Deleuze does some things better than Whitehead, right? And 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 I think you know, as soon, when I when I pass the far past through the occasion that just happened, right? Because this, this is the sort of the inventive structure, and it seems like Deleuze and, and you know through via Bergson, right, gives us access to kind of the whole past. We can actually pre prehend occasions that happened a long, long time ago. They don't have to be, you know, fed through this chain of events. Um, so this is this this is the kind of the aspect of Deleuze that I really found that I didn't get in the, in the way I wanted from Whitehead. Um, I guess my question is, though, it seems to me that their philosophies do do really different kinds of work, right? And uh, and I, first of all, I guess I want, I want to ask you if, if maybe what we're seeing, if you, if you could describe these differences that you're describing as one where, where Whitehead really ends up with a, a vision that's more profoundly pluralistic, uh, pluralism, and whether ultimately where Deleuze ends up is more in a kind of monism, right? Um, and, and I guess the, the, uh, what's at stake there is... Um, I, is you know so so Deleuze is doing this work you know that I really love but uh, but I'm wondering if if uh, right but Whitehead's theory of actual occasions gives us some really important tools that do really important work for us so if we're talking about like the the, the kind of pragmatic use of these symbol constructs um, what 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 Whitehead gives us is, is a real relationalism right there's really someone there and I think of like Spivak's like strategic essentialism, right? Yeah, uh, and I'm wondering, I'm wondering about the, the, I'm worrying about whether Deleuze ultimately, because time is this open, you know, kind of real like kind of collapse in this huge kind of, you know, uh, well of becoming, of chaotic becoming, whether there isn't, whether that, that kind of isn't washed out too much, that relationalism isn't washed out too much, uh, or too kind of ungrounded, right? Um, so anyways, <laughs> I'm in this mode of going on and on. Okay. Well, I, I certainly didn't operate yeah. on the principle that. Can you one, speak. Um, I certainly didn't, out. I didn't operate on the. <laughs> I didn't operate on the principle that one is better. Right. Than okay. Another. Right. 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 I mean, I've tried to yeah. present two different. I think they are two different conceptions of of, of time and temporality. Um, and it seems to me that that Deleuze is working with paradoxical notions of time that I I don't find I don't see in. I don't see him white. And so really that was all yeah, I was trying to present yeah. is just, so what do we do with these, these differing conceptions of, of time? I mean, it's certainly not the idea that one should prefer one over the other. But, um, you know, in, in Deleuze, it seems to me, you have the embrace of, of paradox and the, the embrace of, um, you know, infinite regress in terms of the conception of time that you don't really get yeah. in, in, in Whitehead. At least Whitehead in process and reality. Um, it seems to me that in process and reality, it's, it's much more of a kind of an atomic um, structure of, of time. Okay, we have a, a few right. questions. Um, let everyone's <coughs> make their points. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. 
Okay, so I think I you were first. Roland was first. <laughs> 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 Here, here's a point that, that's kind of related to another. So first I want to say, Keith, I, 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 I agree with you by thinking of, of time and white and the constellation of uh, the concept of events and so on that is hardly to be uh, used for both philosophers. And I have thought about that sometime also. Uh, I think Deleuze is not better, but is later, and therefore is Deleuze says is what later? later. Yeah, yeah. You, you take the philosophers from behind, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> and Biden says something similar. You, you highlight things that they have not said, right, or right. Have, they have to excluded yeah, yeah. in a sense. So there is something that that kind of uh, uh, leads to a, an interesting contrast of, of mutual incompleteness. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, like this. yeah. Okay. The point I want to make is this. I want to again save presentational immediacy here uh, uh, because I think it's not true and and uh, and you have said that yesterday Stephen also it's not true you, you can you can't come to the point of uh, solipsism really with it although it might feel like this and why it makes this interesting point here and I, I want to quote that presentational immediacy is our immediate perception of the contemporary external world appearing as an element constitutive of our own experience. Mm -hmm. In this mm -hmm. appearance, mm -hmm. the world discloses itself to be a community of mm -hmm. actual things right, right. which yeah. are actually in the same sense as we are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he, here is, is much more of the, 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 the idea, the platonic yeah. aura, the, yeah. I, the idea of the, 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 the space between communication <laughs> present, I think, and shining through. Uh, so. Uh -huh. Yeah, that complicates my point there a little bit. Yeah. And I, I think, so then my second point is also just to this here is uh, thinking about this question about, uh, in my, in my uh, you know, was simple, in a simple image for me, I, I thought that Whitehead was, was more kind of temporalizing space and, and it's the other way around with Deleuze, temporalizing, uh, uh, specializing time and having, having talking from, from the perspective of community, uh, uh, continuity instead of discontinuity. That there are something like in Plato, you could say okay, there's what we think is Plato is middle Plato, and then as late, you know, late Plato, that that is a little bit different. There's something in Whitehead at certain points. I think where he, there appears something that that seems to connect to the less, although not worked out, and that's precisely the same point when he talks about mutual immanence mm -hmm. and invention of ideas, page two hundred one. Uh, when, when he says this, the only metaphysical presupposition, the only, 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 nothing, nothing else is mutual immanence, it's not related to time, not to space, not to extension. So, so this, this comes later, and, and it, it raises the question of, of maybe different worlds to be constructed from that. So there's, I think, an opening to a more uh, continuous understanding. And that, that's mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think that, I think you can find these kinds of quotations in both before and after yeah. process and reality. Process and reality, it seems yeah. to me, is you know, it's it's kind of it's quite unique in terms of that con the conception of, of temporality that that appears in there. I, I think you can find much more sort of a, a, a sense of open continuity in the books that come before, in concept of nature um, and adventure of ideas. Come later. It's just process in reality. It seems to me that you know, it really focuses on that hard notion of atomism. It cuts. Great. I, I think uh, we had Catherine next, and then Stephen. I, yeah, I just wanted to say the way that Luke uh, concluded uh, with the radicality of our creative action as springing up out of the, the deep reception of the gift seems to echo very precisely what Stephen uh, did yesterday when summarizing the structure of, of perception you know, in, in terms of <laughs> the being affected by X as the way in which one perceives X actively. So sim mm. that, that similar chiasmus mm. or, or perhaps exactly parallel. Mm -hmm. And that seems to me to get to, to get as a structure then enfolded in the structure of time. There's a, a quirky book <laughs> that draws. Okay, can we please all take our new books out? Hold <laughs> 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 uh, Anonymous book that uh, 
that draws together. It's outrageous. That, 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 <laughs> reading your own book. <laughs> <laughs> this just happens to have in a convenient quote <laughs> from Deleuze, <laughs> but in, in, in which the author does try to pull pull in. <coughs> to uh, some deep resonance, I think not identification at all, Whitehead's mm. structure of time with Deleuze precisely around uh, process and uh, around difference and repetition and the, the three integrations. And this author thought that his three, his triple repetition went this way. There's a triple repetition. First, the past is enfolded in a present, and then a second repetition contemplates that past as a becoming present. You know, you make sense of the words that have been repeated in your mind <laughs> uh, as I say them. And then a third repetition yields the future as such. It is itself the new complete novelty as Deleuze. And this author says that she could not help but hear an echo, perhaps even a repetition of that triple repetition in this passage from Process and Reality, I'm assuming, that experience involves a becoming, one, that becoming, two, means that something becomes, and then three, that what becomes involves repetition transformed into novel immediacy. So that is a way of then reading uh, that, that third integration right into the, the swoop <laughs> of perpetual perishing into a future uh, in which it will be endlessly repeated, but always in a novel way. And of course, there's a paradoxical bond because the repetition suggests the opposite of novelty. But hey, that's what, that's what difference in repetition right. is endlessly, endlessly you know, struggling with, right, eternal recurrence and, and trying to liberate Nietzsche from, <laughs> from appearing to say the eternal re recurrence of the same, trying to translate it into radical novelty. So I, I mean, at least it's, it's a very congruent struggle with a, a paradox of the third repetition into radical novelty. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, I don't think you even need to go to another author. I mean, you can read it in Deleuze. Mm -hmm. Right, if you I mean, if you read Deleuze is the fold, I mean Deleuze it's it well he yeah. doesn't yeah. explicitly yeah. talk about the the three syntheses, but Deleuze clearly has a so I'm, my old my paper is going against Deleuze's reading, if we can mm -hmm. call it a reading of, of Whitehead. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, in Deleuze it seems to me you can you can find this this conception of um, Whiteheadian time that mm -hmm. Deleuze himself talks about. Mm -hmm. The notion of prehensions being open to infinity, um, and it's it's pretty clear in you know, in Deleuze's own reading, which I think is a, a misreading. It's being it's doing a Deleuze. The event. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have a, actually before I get to my question, I wanted to say something just based on what you said. Um, the, on, the only time I ever met Felix Guattari, I got to talk to him for two minutes. And I remember what he said to me is that it was while they were writing What is Philosophy. And Guattari, I was asking, I don't even want to ask him. I, he was saying something, he said, well, you know, the way Gilles is, he just wants to grab you out the collar and say, you're really the same thing as this other thing. And everything's, you know, already saying the same thing. And Guattari sort of indicated, well, I'm not as fanatical about that as Gilles is. So um, <laughs> and I think that very much fits what you're saying about Deleuze and Whitehead. Yeah. Okay, but the question, I mean, um, even though you mentioned the phenomenology, which I mentioned hmm. yesterday, I'm much more interested, I mean, w your whole paper is on one of the things in both White and Deleuze that preoccupies me the most because I haven't quite been able to get my head around it, though I found what you were saying helps. But, um, okay, so, my understanding of the epical theory of time and process and reality is, I mean, it actually goes back to George Lucas right in the 80s saying that he argues that basically Whitehead was, I mean, he doesn't mention Zeno, though I think what you say about Zeno, which is Whitehead's explicit reason, is that um, if everything's becoming and becoming is continuous, then you never have a distinct point where anything's you know separate from anything else and it all becomes this kind of, I'm not quoting exactly, because I don't remember exactly how the mm -hmm. but you know, so that white, so <laughs> Lucas claims that Whitehead shifts between concept of nature and process of reality because 
he sees this Bergsonian model he adopted first as a kind of problem mm -hmm. that, you know, the distinction gets too much dissolved if you don't have time becoming epical. Okay, so I think what you were saying in terms of how Whitehead himself explains terms, you know, helps, helps me that, and also the relation to William James. Mm -hmm. I mean, Lucas, yeah, I, I remember, actually that. seems to associate William James more with Bergson, but in fact, the drops of time and the transitions between the, you know, incident yeah. drops of time in, in, in James is much closer to what it's going to. But what I'm really trying to, what I've been really trying to struggle with, and this, this partly, I don't want to drag this in too much because it's part of my own preoccupation, so I write a lot about film, um, is how you think of the three syntheses of time in difference of repetition in relation to the two types of image in the cinema books where um, there Deleuze has the movement image and the time image. The movement image, which he associates with classical film and also with classical or pre-Kantian philosophy, sees time as only indirectly expressed as the measure of movement. <coughs> and what the move and then in the second volume, what he sees happening in modernist cinema starting in the middle of the 20th century, and which he associates both with Kant and you know and the Shakespearean phrase, time is out of joint, and with Bergson. He says at one point that Bergson isn't as different from Kant about time as Bergson himself thought. Is this other, you know, pure duration, time, a little time in the pure state, improves time being released in, on, on, it, on its own instead of being subordinated to movement? That's sort of the, the modern, moving to modern yeah. cinema and also in, in philosophical modernity. So part of the trouble <laughs> I've had is how to link that Though that account of time, how it relates to the syntheses in difference of repetition, and then the further question which you were addressing, how both of those relate to Whitehead's theory of time. This is one of these things I've been circling around about for a long time without quite figuring out how it works. There actually are, um, Patricia Pisters, who's a film theorist, just recently wrote a book where she basically argues the movement image equals the first synthesis in difference of repetition, the time image equals the second synthesis in mm -hmm. In, in different tradition, the third synthesis yeah. is what happens in cinema after Deleuze died or after Deleuze wrote. But I'm not sure. I, I don't really <laughs> buy that. But I, I don't buy that. But it's but it's addressing the kind of problem. And as I said, would you everything? So I'm not sure this is a question, but everything you said helped for me to clarify this without my being able to come to any conclusions about it. Put it that way. So. Well, as I said at the beginning, I mean, I, I think in terms of that distinction, with yeah, the image and time image, it maps better onto Ion and Cronos. Yeah. And that and that is the distinction that they they retain, that they mm -hmm. they use in what is philosophy. Yeah. That they use in uh, a thousand plateaus. I'm still not sure how it fits into the cinema books though. Yeah. Yeah now that mm -hmm. I have to I have Okay. To <laughs> I'm gonna think about that. Well anyway, thanks. Because that you know without giving me any answers that helped me, you know, try to all this work <laughs> in my brain. I think we have time for one more question or comment, and I saw Michael's hand first. Uh, yeah, thank you. I was, I don't know how to put this. Uh, all right, I'll put it in the way, I've got two contradictory things I want to say. Just as I realized yesterday that actually uh, causal efficacy isn't about causation, I had a sudden thought as you were talking that actually Whitehead's epochal theory of time isn't about time. I'll just leave that aside for a minute. <laughs> because well, you can't I, I just leave that aside. <laughs> no, but, okay. but no, precisely because he's trying to shift the question so much okay. that it's actually, we, we, he's, he draws us in and then drags us mm -hmm. to a place where it, it's no longer about time, it's actually about, and in symbolism, it's about confirmation of state to state, which oh. then becomes what we used to think of as time. It's one way of thinking about it. <clears throat> then my second point was, I agree with the Ion and Kronos, etc. But I think when you're thinking about the epochal theory of time, you need to think about the extensive continuum as well. I think that might help sort out some of the because you're dislocating it somewhat. And I don't want to say any more than that because I, yeah, there's no point. <laughs> All right. But I think um, it might be helpful as a way. I mean, I'm just defending Whitehead because. <laughs> well, I, I don't. Okay. Um, did Did you have a sh uh, brief a short one? But okay. we'll probably continue on into the break. But uh, <laughs> um, I, I do think you're you're right to emphasize the notion of the infinite um, and the Zeno uh, 
aspect for both Whitehead and, and Deleuze. And, and I don't think Deleuze had read this book, but there's an interesting book by Jose Benardetti, who was an analytic philosopher at Syracuse for a number of years, a book called Infinity, an Essay in Metaphysics. And he has what he calls the Zeno procedure. And he actually argues in a very Deleuzean fashion that you can carry out an infinite number of steps in a minute. Uh, in other words, he basically takes the Zeno challenge and says, yeah, you can affirm it. I mean, without, without the paradox, without the contradiction. But the key step here, and, and this kind of gets into what Michael was saying, is you have to abandon the extensive notion of division, you have to abandon the extensive notion of, of time and, and, and enumeration and embrace an intensive notion of, of, of difference. And that's where you kind of get into the, to the Deleuzean notion. So there's an interesting, and he wrote that book in like two years. What's the name of the author? Uh, Jose Benardetti. Oh. He was a, a philosopher. Right? He's, he gives great lectures. You should look him up on YouTube. He has these mm. lectures. He's just, uh, he comes up with these hilarious arguments that they actually are pretty good. The Zeno procedure sounds like a great science fiction oh, Yeah, it would be, yeah. <laughs> sounds pretty kinky, too. <laughs> Okay, great. Well, that brings us to an end for this session. We'll reconvene at 4.